The whole world is governed by laws, the universe, in fact. Laws. We call it the law of electricity. We call it the law of gravity. There's mathematical laws. There's physical laws, speed and velocity laws, agricultural laws. There's all kinds of laws. Now that we find ourselves on the spinning planet, you just have to learn what I call the setup. Learn the setup. Life's setup. Now, we didn't set it up, but we're here, so you got to learn it. And we should learn the setup for two basic reasons. Number one, to keep from getting hurt. It's one of the major reasons for learning, so you won't get hurt. See, economically, socially, personally, you can get hurt just not knowing. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is poverty. Ignorance is tragedy. You got to know or you're going to get hurt. It's good to know not to walk out the 10 story window. That's excellent information. Now, what if a guy didn't know and he walks out? Now he's dead at the bottom. Somebody says, well, the poor guy didn't know. <laughs> you gotta know or you're gonna get hurt. Okay. Now here's a parenthesis. You don't have to like the setup. I don't ask you to like how it is. That's not what's important. But it is important to learn how it is. Okay, so you don't have to like it, but you should learn it. That's what I tell the kids, right? Make sure you get the information. What you think about it, that's up to you. What you're going to do with it, that'll soon be up to you. But make sure you get it. See, there's nothing worse than being stupid. Nothing. I mean, being broke is bad. But being stupid is awful. And what's really bad is being broken stupid, right? <laughs> That's about the end of the world. I mean, there isn't anything much worse than that. Unless you're sick. Sick, broken, stupid. I mean, that is it, right? <laughs> There's nowhere else to go. So make sure you get the information. It's key. You don't have to like it, but learn it. If this big monstrous thing lifts up in the sky, hangs there for a little while, cuts loose, comes crashing down, boom, shakes the ground for five miles. And then this big monstrous thing lifts back up in the sky, hangs there for a little while, cuts loose again, comes crashing down, boom, shakes the ground for five miles. It just keeps doing that, this big monstrous thing, lifting up and then crashing down, boom. Now, you might come along one day and say, that's got to be a stupid arrangement which is okay. You're entitled to your opinion. But the first thing you should learn to do is get out from under it, right? <laughs> That's number one. You might have a great moral argument. You might want to shake your finger at the sky, but do it from over there, right? So you don't get smashed. It's called your basic smart. So number one, learn so you won't get hurt. Whether you like it or not, learn. Now here's the second reason for learning the setup to benefit. It's called the plus of life. And that's what life is, right? Both minus and plus. The minus is tragedy, heartache, misery, failure, unhappiness. But life is also happiness, prosperity, good feelings. So here's the key. Learn to get on the good side of the way things work. Now, here's two of the basic laws, and we'll take our break. Shof taught me these. They come from the Bible. Now, again, I'm an amateur, okay? When it comes to the Bible, I'm not a pro. So you'll sort of have to take my way of putting it. But here they are. The first one is the law of use. The law of use. And it goes something like this. Whatever you don't use, you lose. Lack of use causes loss. On this planet, maybe not the next one, but on this one. If you tie your arm to your body, leave it there long enough, you'll never use it again. It's over for the arm. Now, it may not be over, but it's over for the arm. The only way to keep the use of this arm is what? Keep using it. If you quit, you lose automatically. They don't bring it up for a vote. 
you lose automatically when you quit. Now the same thing that goes for your arm goes for your brain, mentality. The same thing goes for all the human virtues. Ambition, unused, declines. Strong feelings, unused, diminish. It doesn't grow, it diminishes. Faith, unused, decreases. It's a law. Vitality, unused, diminishes. Energy, unused, decreases. The guy says, well, I'm going to save up my energy. You can't do that. That's like trying to save today, put it on the end of the year. See, you can't do that. They'll come take you away. If you don't use today, what? It's lost. The guy says, well, I'll work twice as hard tomorrow to make up for it. See, that's foolish. You could have done that anyway. Today unused is lost. A talent unused is lost. An ability unused is lost. So here's one of the key expressions of the evening. Take a new inventory of yourself. Starting tomorrow, new project. Take a new inventory. And make sure that all of your talent and ability and mentality and ingenuity and vitality and strong feelings, faith, courage, make sure that all you've got is being used. Otherwise, you lose. Now, one of the best illustrations of the law of use is a Bible story called the parable of the talents. The talent story. Interesting story if you haven't read it in a while. Just review it. It's a good story. An ancient story says there was a master with three servants. He got them together one day and he said to the three, I've got these talents. And in those ancient days, a talent was a measure of gold. And he said to the three servants, take these talents and see what you can do with them while I'm gone. He said, I'm taking a journey and I'll be gone for a while. When I come back, we'll get together, go over the book, see how you did. He said, here's five of these talents for you, five. Here's two of them for you, two. And here's one for you, one. The master said, take those talents, see what you can do with them. When I come back, we'll get together, we'll go over it all. The servant said, okay, master takes off. According to the ancient story, the master comes back from his trip. When he gets back, he gets the three servants together. And as he said he would, he asks, how did it go with those talents? You're five. What happened? That servant said, well, I took the five talents you gave me and I put them to work. A little shaky at first, but he said things finally got rolling. And he said, I poured it on. And he said, my talents grew to seven, eight, nine, ten. He said, I doubled my talents from five to ten. Books will show. Master said, one heck of a job or something like that. He said, I gave you two talents, what happened? That servant said about the same thing happened to me. I put those two talents to work, poured it on, they grew to three and then to four. He said, I doubled my talents from two to four. Books will show. Master said, well done. He said, I gave you one talent, what happened? That servant said, well, I took the talents you gave me and I carefully wrapped it and I dug a hole and buried it and camouflaged it, I suppose, right? so nobody would steal it. And he said, fortunately, nobody got it. And he said, I knew you were going to be here today, so I dug it up. Here it is, safely wrapped. I did not lose it while you were gone. According to the ancient story, the master said, take that talent away from him and give it to the man that's got 10. Now you might say, well, I don't like that arrangement. The poor guy's only got one talent. He's already got 10. It ought to be more even. Remember, I didn't ask you to like it, but this one I would ask you to learn because it simply means whatever you do not employ, you forfeit. It's a law. So learn well the law of use. Now here's the second one and we're going to take our break. Second law.
from the Bible. This one we've heard since we were small, I'm sure. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. In fact, we've probably heard it so often we could quote it. It says, whatever you sow, what? You shall reap. Fairly blunt, hopefully clear. Here's my first suggestion on the law of sowing and reaping. Don't try to beat it. You might as well try sitting on the sun in the morning. Keep it from coming up. You'll have better luck. <laughs> Whatever you sow, you reap. Now, for a fair share of my life, I'm a bit mixed up on how all this applies, among a lot of things I was mixed up on. I knew I wasn't reaping too good. That I understood. My problem was I was confused about what was causing it. Remember me with the funny list? I thought those are the reasons why it isn't working out well. And then Mr. Schof gave me the clue that helped me figure it all out. He said, Mr. Owen, I have another answer for you. There's another way to quote this law that'll show you where the problem is so you can go to work on it right away. All you need to know is where the problem is. Then you can go to work on it. So he quoted me the law another way, and I found out what my problem was. Here's the way you quote the law. Whatever you reap is what you've sown. Now I knew what my problem was. Whatever you reap is what you've sown. If you don't like the crop, who do you look up? Answer, whoever planted it. And where do you find who planted your crop? Answer, in the mirror. <laughs> what I finally learned to do come fall was to go to the mirror. That's where you go. And if necessary, you say, a few skinny carrots? I got to be unimpressed. Where were you last spring? Asleep. Didn't you read the books? Did you break your hoe? Let me give you seven key points to the law of sowing and reaping. Let's tick right down through the list of seven, and it'll be break time. Seven points to sowing and reaping. Here's part of the philosophy that really helped me to make some changes in life direction. Number one, the law of sowing and reaping is negative. That's number one, which simply means if you sow bad, you reap bad. Now, this is kind of third grade, but it doesn't hurt to go over the basics. If you plant thistle seeds, you don't get pumpkins. Honest, no use looking for pumpkins. John says, how come no pumpkins? Come on, John. The law's negative. That's how come. Now, here's number two. The law's positive which simply means if you sow good, you reap good. If you plant pumpkin seeds, you don't get thistles. Not from pumpkin seeds. Mother Nature won't pull tricks on you over in the corner snicker and push new thistles and you plant pumpkin seeds. She won't do that. You will get pumpkins from pumpkin seeds and the reason is because the law is positive. Now here's number three. I got excited when I found out the full dimension of this. See, you do not reap what you sow. But rather, you always reap much more than what you sow. So the third key word is more. You don't get back what you put out. You get back much more than what you put out. And it works both positive and negative. On the negative side, it said, if you sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. So you got to get ready for that or you will be naive. See, anybody can, whether you will or not. See, that's the question. And here's a good question to ask. We are all buying somebody's plan. The question is, who's? Who's got you talked into doing what you're doing? Who's got you talked into your present plan? See, 10 years from now, you will surely arrive. The question is, where? 
<laughs> but see, anybody, if you want to, can go searching for a good plan, pick it, and start working it. And sure enough, as the time passes, as it surely will, five years from now, ten years from now, then you'll be winding up wearing what you want to wear, driving what you want to drive, living where you want to live, become what you want to become. But now's the time to fix the next ten years. And who can? Anybody. Here's number six. The sixth key to sowing and reaping. This is leveling with you now as we promised to do. There's one thing better than the truth, and that's the whole truth. And here's part of the whole truth of the law of sowing and reaping. Number six is you could lose. There are times when you just lose, no matter what you do. It's that kind of planet. You reap what you sow, yes, but. What does that mean, yes, but? Well, the farmer plants his crop in the spring, takes care of it all summer, loves his family, works 10, 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week, is an honorable man. Come fall, he's got a beautiful crop, and he deserves every bit of it but the day before he sends the combines into the field a hailstorm comes along and beats it all in the ground which means you lose <laughs> somebody says well what did he do wrong answer nothing it's just that kind of planet sometimes it's going to hail on your crop and rain on your parade so you got to get ready for that or you will be naive that's just part of the life arrangement and don't press me why i was not in on some of the original decisions here so i don't know how it got set up but there's just time sometimes you lose that's part of life but now here's number seven the seventh key to sowing and reaping and it goes like this it's just another way to quote the same law and it goes like this if you don't sow, that's just another way to quote the law. If you don't sow, what? You don't reap. You don't even have a chance. So if you looked at your game plan tomorrow, you might come to the quick conclusion. I got to get some sowing going. How true. Get you some sowing going. And remember, you've got plenty of time. You've got all the time there is. Some people spend enough TV time to make a fortune. The latest article on television watching in this country, according to the latest article, the average television is on in this country in every household seven hours a day, called the Big Seven. I asked a guy one time what his TV cost. He said about $450. I said, you forgot to look at the price tag. He said, what do you mean? I knew he was a TV watcher. I said, that television costs you, in my opinion, at least $12,000 a year to watch it, not to own it. Owning it's cheap. Watching it is what's expensive. And I said, hey, $12,000 a year is too much to pay to watch TV. That's too much. Pay a little, but not $12,000. Thousand. And he's the guy that said, I hope pay TV never comes. <laughs> okay. We're trying to cover an awful lot tonight. I realize that. But my time schedule is such that uh, we just have to sort of give it all to you and let you uh, sort the rest out. I wish we had plenty of time for questions and answers and that whole thing, but our time is just limited. But uh, we are trying to go through an awful lot, I realize that. But it uh, looks like everybody's getting it. This is about the note-takingest crowd I've seen in a long time. Incredible. Does anybody have five pages yet? Anybody? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Incredible. Okay. Maybe you heard the story about the preacher down in Texas, southern part of the country. Um, he was an evangelist back in the horse and buggy days. And uh, he was very good at being an evangelist. And a lot of people used to come and hear him preach. 
And one day he put up his tent in one of these Texas towns and expected a big crowd as usual, come here and preach. And he got there first night of the tent revival, walked in, 7.30, time to start. And to his surprise, the tent was empty. He thought, well, something must be drastically wrong. So he waited till quarter to eight, nobody showed up. Eight o'clock, zip. Finally, 8.15, one lone cowboy wandered up on his horse, tied his horse up outside, came in, sat down on the front bench, right, waiting for something to happen. The preacher thought, well, at least I better go down and talk to the cowboy. So he walks down, talks to the cowboy, and he says, cowboy, I'm the preacher. And he said, I don't know what to tell you. Something's gone wrong. He said, this tent was supposed to be full of people. He said, I'm embarrassed. He said, you're the only one that showed up. And he said, I really don't know what to do. And the cowboy said, well, I'm not a preacher, so I really can't tell you what to do. You know, he said, I'm just a cowboy. But he said, I know this, if I went out to feed my cattle and only one showed up, I'd at least feed it. The preacher thought, hey, the cowboy is right. If you've got a good idea to share, you should share it if there's one or a thousand. So he got kind of inspired by this conversation and he jumped up on the platform and started to preach as if the tent was full of people, just exploded. And he went for an hour, hour and 15 minutes, just kept rolling, finally he quit. And when he finished, he came down off the platform, talked to the cowboy again. Says, well, cowboy, what did you think of my sermon? And the cowboy said, uh, well, I'm not a preacher, so I really can't tell. You know, he said, I'm just a cowboy. But he said, I know this. If I went out to feed my cattle and only one showed up, I'd feed it, but I wouldn't dump the whole load on it. 